Uh, leadership, the what, the why. Um, Dr. Moises Aron is a staff physician at both the Department of Hospital Medicine and the Department of Pediatric Hospital Medicine at the Cleveland Clinic. He is dual board certified in internal medicine and pediatrics, as well as in pediatric hospital medicine. Dr. Aron is a professor of medicine and pediatrics at the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine of Case Western Reserve University. He's a core faculty at both the internal medicine residency program and the Pediatric Hospital Medicine Fellowship Program. He is the Quality Improvement and Patient Safety Officer of the Department of Hospital Medicine, Cleveland Clinic main campus, and the Medical Director of Blood Management, Cleveland Clinic, which also covers intraoperative cell saver utilization. Dr. Aron is also an advanced peer coach and mentor at the Cleveland Clinic Center for Executive Coaching and Mentoring. He has a special interest in hospital and perioperative medicine, quality and patient safety, with emphasis in flood management and publicly reported healthcare measures. He's also passionate about coaching and mentoring. In pediatrics, his area of interest includes hospital and perioperative medicine, as well as pediatric obesity, eating disorders, and transition to adulthood of patients with complex chronic diseases of childhood. Um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Elrond. Thank you so much uh, for this very kind introduction. It's always a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I mean, always with my medical colleagues, um, Dr. Howard Rainer, a long way, and um, it's uh, certainly a, a joy to share with the new generation. And uh, when he asked me about the grand round, we, I gave him a variety of clinical topics that I consistently give nationally, and, and I gave some non-clinical goals. I would like the leadership one because we want to do some leadership training as well for all our trainees. You know what? That's fine. I, as a matter of fact, um, I give a variety of these talks for Cleveland Clinic staff that they go to a special interest group in leadership. So um, I have no major disclosure. I am the governor-elect for the Ohio chapter for the American College of Physicians. I sit in the sub-board of Pediatric Hospital Medicine for the American Board of Pediatrics, and I'm a member of the Cleveland Clinic Board of Governors. So I, I, before I go to this, I want to show you this. What does this person, this lady, this gentleman, and this gentleman have in common? Oh, all right. Sorry. Um, so what does this person have in common? I would like to make it interactive. Feel free to, to gel back. So do you know who they are? So, so we have, they are all leaders, right? So uh, we have Angela Merkel. Who is the lady in the bottom, in the black and white? Eleanor Roosevelt, right? Eleanor Roosevelt was very influential on her husband, who was one of the greatest presidents of the United States. But it's important to acknowledge her role in defining the destiny of the country, too. And we have Elon Musk. I mean, although without, whether it is not our popularity, this gentleman is impressive. I mean, he's revamping the chase for conquering space, and he's creating new innovation, disruptive innovation that are really changing the way we see the world. So the, the main thing with a physician is that all physicians have certain leadership skills, but you have to model against different mentors. So when we look at the previous slide, leadership is a skill set. You, you, that skill set will be very practical, is dynamic, and we're going to have multiple iterations throughout this talk on how the dynamic elements of it will apply in different circumstances. But the most important thing is the ability to guide and to influence. So the guiding and the influence is a paramount characteristic. I mean, a president, what was, will guide the, the country, will take decisions that will guide the way we do things. The CEO of this hostel, he will promote a vision and mission, and everybody will 
tries to synergize and work in a parallel way toward a common goal. So the common goal is very important. So in this case, her common goal was the unity of Europe, growing Europe and, and providing a stability uh, in the world balance. Her, her common goal was supporting her husband, supporting her country, making her country greater, and be a true move, a, a leader for one of the initial uh, female leaders in, in the world. Uh, Macron, his common goal is the stability of uh, when he took the, the control of his country, there was a lot of political instability, so the integration to Europe. And then, of course, even most is to innovate. I mean, he's just looking into um, having electrical cars, innovating space, innovating new ways of doing technology, etc. So all of them have a common goal of growth. There's not a, not a goal of, of um, destruction. So when you look at the leader, there are certain words that have to resonate with you and the perspective of a leader. Like, which words would come to any of you when you see um, your, your, the leader of the hospital or the leader of your organization? What do you expect them to represent? Integrity. Integrity. Integrity is fundamental. Why do you think that's important? I think you have to trust your leader if you're going to follow them um, in their plan. Absolutely. What other words come to your mind for a leader? Come on. We don't have have integrity. So good communication. Recept being receptive, um, enhance, um, uh, provide the liberty and freedom for other people to express. That's very important. Good communication. What else? Reliable. Reliable. Oh, Reliable. Yes, ab absolutely. Accountability. What else? Uh, in the chat, they said team builder and teamwork. The teamwork, team. right? Promoting teamwork, promoting the cohesiveness of the group. A good leader is not going to divide you. Oh, you are the guy that work in the rainbow peripheral, and you are the guy that work in the main rainbow. A good leader will say, you guys are case western, you guys are rainbow. We are one rainbow. We all work together. We all have a mission, and we will all integrate and we'll all have the same opportunity. That makes sense? A good leader integrates people. So we have, it should be, I mean, I have a couple of words uh, here that I, I related. I want to use the laser pointer. We have, I mean, it should be caring. They should have compassion, promote uh, teamwork. They should also can serve as mentors, communication, should be closed loop, should be open, should be clear, and should be transparent. So those things, now of course the provision of vision is always very important. But you have other words like engagement. So if we did this, this word salad in an exercise where people start putting and we created the word salad and I decided to keep it this way. But these, all of these are things that you expect uh, from your leader. Now, to effective leadership, so if you are in the OR operating in a ruptured aortic aneurysm, or you are in the newborn nursery trying to discharge 30 healthy kids, or you are in the PQ uh, trying to intubate an asthmatic, and I'm using clinical examples here. What, will that leadership style be the same? It will not, right? It's a completely different circumstance. When you have the leadership style when you're coming to a system that is broken, that doctors are resigning, they're going elsewhere, where it's hard to find nurses, where it's, oh, wait a second, let's find out what's going on here. 
because we need to fix the system to make it, um, but you have to have a very different type of style in this situation. So you will have to be adaptable because you may come with different skill sets, with different culture. I mean, I'm, coming, I'm from Mexico, right? I mean, no matter I have been living here for 20 years, I will never stop being a Mexican man with a very specific way of thinking. And I'm also very Jewish. I also have also another scenario on how I think. But my framework has to adapt to different cultures. It's very important that the, the leaders have to go that. Flexibility. You, you will have to, to sometimes, uh, you know that you're going to bend rules or cut red tape, but you have to be flexible and, and you have to be able to be creative because the different situation will demand different type of response. Well, this is more like about the leader that actually is, is um, um, being, uh, having a more authority. Well, they direct, they may correct or reward performance. I mean, you, you always have to make, I mean, we all provide feedback. I don't know about you, but when you have a, the real job, I get feedback on my teaching course, I get feedback on my patient's course, my HCAP course, I get feedback on how much money I bring to the hostel, I get feedback on my mortality index, I get feedback on my case mix index. Whether I want or not that feedback, probably don't want it, I get. But that's fine, because then I learn. But you have to, to understand that you get exposed to new situations, you have to adapt to that and try to make the best out of it. But definitely empowering others. We always talk about teamwork and communication and accountability. Now, do you think that all your leaders, they were like that in the very beginning? Like uh, Dr. Salada or uh, Dr. Armitage, they were like those great leaders they are just when they were born? No. They, they, I mean, they developed skill sets and scenarios where they've been resolving problems, and then eventually they get developing this incredible skill set that they make them super valuable, and they inspire others. So it's very understanding that you can acquire and develop. This slide sometimes triggers a lot of anxiety, because I, I pinpoint, like, like somebody in the audience, uh, well, you're not in your head, you are pinpoint. Do you think you can be a leader? Yes, you can be a leader. You're already a leader. I mean, you're already leading. You're, you're a physician. You're taking care of your patient. But can you influence another? Yes, you can. Each one of you. But the thing is, that you oh my God, my chairman, will I ever be a chairman? Will I ever be there? Oh my God, how can we do that? It's part of a growth process. You, you don't, first of all, a chairman doesn't get you, will be the chairman. They apply for chairman. There's, there's interviews, there's competition, you have to have your CV, you have to demonstrate things. You have to give a lecture like this to a bunch of authorities, telling them how will you will fix fictitious problems. Behavioral intelligence, emotional intelligence, all of these things. So you can acquire and develop the skills. So who's this guy? Who's this gentleman? Not Dr. Stechauer. <laughs> Do you know who he is? Lombardi. Being Lombardi, right? Yes. Thank you for the word. Um, so, so being so who was being Lombardi? Who was he? Was coach of what? Tennis? Football coach, right? The best football coach ever. I mean, the guy that revolutioned the way we play. We play. I. <laughs> that, that American football is being played. I don't play it football. Um, so he revolutioned that. Um, it was, it was, uh, he inspired players. He was a hard coach. He was not an easy person to work with. He was not an easy coach, but he was definitely the best coach. And he created this, this statement. The leaders are made, they are not born. But well, they're made by the effort, which is a price we all pay for achieving a goal that is worthwhile. I mean, you all are here. I mean, you remember when you were a student, when you were doing your use of list, when you were applying for residency, when you have to interview, and now when you're applying for a fellowship, it just, it, it never stops. 
and then you apply for a new position and you apply for an award and you apply you keep applying for things. It never stops. It's not a status quo. You let me just tell you up front. Well you can have status quo if you want. I normally don't have a status quo. But the thing is those goals that you really want, then you you work for that. And at least it can help you to develop leadership skills. So what does a good leader most convey? What does this life make you think about? Vision, right? Like where, where do we go? Where do we want to go? What else? Okay. What? Clarity. Clarity. It should be clear, right? It should make things look where we want, and, and, and it should be really clear what we are headed to, and transparency, right? It should be very transparent. But they need to make you understand where are you going, what is the purpose of the group, what are we looking for. Now, the, the set of values become to that very first slide that we show. Integrity, accountability, good communication, foster teamwork, being a good listener, being patient, be tolerant. So those things are really relevant characteristics. Why do you think that vision is important? You can bring that. You, you want. I mean, day to day stuff is great, but if you want to achieve long term goals, you need to be working on it over time. Absolutely. And as a matter of fact, the vision and the mission statement, whenever you go to any company website, you will re look at the vision statement, the mission statement. Where are we heading towards? And what is our sense of purpose? This will be in every single company, medical and non-medical, that is in the world. Why? Because it, it, where are we going? I become the CEO of General Motors. That would be really cool, right? Um, so where are we going? I mean, we are competing against the electric cars. So how can we transform our industry? All what we have, we have huge factories that are trying to make motors that work on gasoline. How can we revamp this? So that one a vision, where are we heading to 2050, 2070, next 50 years from now, where do we want to be? So that requires brainstorming, requires creativity, requires good knowledge of the past. That's what I'm telling you, like your leaders, they have experience from previous experiences. That experience helps them mold the next one. So we spoke about the different leadership style, and not all of them are going to be. So we're going to speak about the Goldman's leadership style, the five different, different ones. The first type is coercive. So the coercive is that you have to have immediate compli compliance. It's an order. It's not a suggestion. It's not asking about your feelings. It's do this, and you have to do that. It, it drives initiative. Now, the impact on climate is negative. But if I am a surgeon, and I'm operating at abdomen, the AAA explodes, am I going to allow my intern to figure it out on yourself, on himself, or themselves now? Or I'm going to go and get in a Tinsky and clamp the aorta and try to really take control of things. And then afterward, I will have to maybe debrief. It may be a situation where the intern or the resident will say, well, I felt terrible with this doctor. He yelled at me in the OR. Well, there was a life on stake. So you, you know, if you are in the middle of a, a hurricane in the Pacific and you are the captain of this ship, and the waves are way taller than the ship. I mean, if you want to say, well, if you feel, just go to your room, don't worry about it. I mean, he's going to tell you to do things. So this is important, and we need to acknowledge the circumstances in which a leader may need to behave this way. Now, we don't want, I don't want to behave this way. I mean, we will always try to have control circumstances. That's where the good vision and mission is and engaging the team, and we are all working parallel. But if you have a pandemic, and suddenly the whole Cleveland is sick with COVID, 
and you have the EDs are exploding, well, you have to have some, some, some um, the need to change the way we work. And it is not about um, just rubbing on the people's shoulders. You have to give orders to achieve compliance. That makes sense. Now, also stated, this is more, although the word sound like it's not the same as coercive. The coercive will point you towards something and demand immediate response. The authoritative is basically a, that leader that is providing a very specific vision and wants everybody to move to that vision. It changes the way we practice, changes the way we're doing things, and um, they are very empathetic. And it's often positive. When you get a, a new chairman, or, or, you're, or you're, you're starting, you, when you started as a new program director, you have to take things over and move it to a new, okay, we want to be the best mass peace fraction in the United States. This is our goal. How are we going to do that? How am I going to engage my faculty? How am I going to make sure that you don't have the trouble with the medicine guys and the peace guys? They, they, they want a piece of each of you in both sides, right? Uh, I was a medical person. I, I, I know what it was. When I was in medicine, I had to go to my, my peace clinic, and they were so frustrated about that. When I was in pediatric, I wanted to go to my medicine clinic. Anyway, my point is the authoritative leader comes to try to change that culture and in, in try to have everybody align, but, but it provides a guidance. Now, who's this guy? Yeah. Do you like the lasso? <laughs> no, do you like it? <laughs> I love the lasso. Um, I mean, this is, Jason today is a genius. Uh, I mean, I really, really think that um, it's a good way to do it. So it creates harmony. It helps to build uh, teamwork. This is very useful when you are coming to a place that is very disruptive with negative uh, environment where people are not talking to each other, where people are not happy, where there's no common sense of purpose. You have to integrate and align each individual into the team and demonstrate that each individual brings value and brings importance. So these people interview with each person to bring their insight and then have a collective talk together. So it's very positive. The problem is if you are in the AAA that is just worked out, what do you think? Should we use a team key or we just keep suctioning? <laughs> I mean, like, uh, oh, this, 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 this blood looks very red. Hey, anesthesia, good job with the oxygen. Uh, uh, I mean, no, right? You cannot do that. So there, there, there's moment for each type of thing. Now, they may, maybe the coercive leader can develop an affiliated leadership style after the crisis, when they have to, to come on to the brief. The briefing is important. Um, when you guys have a hard day in the hospital, when there were difficult conversations with patients, when there were difficult conversations with nursing, do you guys ever debrief? You sit down, you sit down, you talk within each other, um, blows them off, but the debriefing helps to heal, but also helps to find out what can we do better the next time. So the, the, the affiliated leader is going to have a very specific characteristic, which is the deliberate listening. So um, there was, there was a, a, a um, baseball player, his name was Yogi Berra. Have you heard about Yogi Berra? was very, very famous, very intelligent, but he used to say a bunch of different things, but end up being very wise, all what he said. And he said, when you listen, you may hear something. <laughs> so, so, it was, uh, uh, so it, it, listening is, is, is important. Uh, it should be deliberate, to be very focused, just being attentive on the moment. Good listening helps to convey respect, helps to find gaps. Your gap, the gap from their own leaders. Oh, I did not think about it, okay? That way they keep taking notes. And good listening should not interrupt. And there is definitely the comfort with silence is paramount. I mean, okay? So 
we're talking. So it's important to allow the other people. I mean, sometimes you have those meetings and that are like 20 minutes. But those 20 minutes are not for the leader to talk, it's for you to talk. But sometimes it's not that way it is, and those leaders need to train. But if the other person is not talking, then you don't talk. Until some, something comes up. I mean, you, you can definitely help uh, facilitate a conversation. So if somebody is not talking, then you need to facilitate. But not everybody has good facilitators. Democratic leader. So when do you think that a, a democratic leader um, should uh, be implemented? Well, I mean, you're going to take decisions about are we changing the, let's say within your, within your, your own thing, should we change the MedFit clinic day? I mean, I'm sure you have clinic day every day, right? Uh, but should we change the MedFit clinic location? Do we change, should we include this elective versus not elective? So you, start, you, you come up with different styles, you force consensus, it's not going to be something that has to be implemented right away, but allow everybody to voice them, to the pitching. So it's important that having the democratic leadership style that the whole team participates. And, and there should be an engagement. The, the quiet um, team member needs to be brought into the conversation. Now, again, from all, all the different types of leadership can be happening at the same time in different circumstances. So you build a culture, making sure everybody finds a fit within the environment. Now, good leaders need to ensure that they establish connection. I mean, they can tell you one thing. What do you think is important for me um, for instance, being a governor for ACP Ohio chapter and being in the ACP. Is that because I build up my ego and I go all bloated to, to those me? No. It's because one of you guys tell me, Dr. Ron, I would like to do residence in Nebraska. I want to find a job in Nebraska. Do you think there will be any positive? Sure. Grab the phone, talk to the ACP governor for Nebraska ACP chapter. Hey, guys, have a person that wants to go to Nebraska, have family there. What possibilities are there for them to do an interview in your place? Or, or in your So it's to create bond. Medical student, doctor, I want to do ophthalmology. What is very okay? I grab the phone, I talk to the person in the Cola Institute. Hey, you know what? I have this brilliant medical resident, I want to do ophthalmology, it doesn't have any research, send him my way. So it's to help others. The networking is not about your ego. Leaders that connect with people for themselves but don't help others, they should not be in those positions. The networking is the connection, is to help others. The connection is not for me to go to the meeting and I can say hi to all of them, you know, because I say, Dr. Tehauer, this is this other doctor, this other doctor, this is Dr. Tehauer. Connect them. Now it's up to you for, to, to continue that connection. The same thing with any single position. So a piece of advice from this is network as much as you can. You go to meetings, don't just play the role of like, well, I'm just waiting to go to the, to the whatever it is at 10 p.m. I mean, try to connect with other residents. Try to give your card to other doctors. Try to get to, it's, it is an incredible degree of a waste of time and resources when you go to meetings and you don't know people. I mean, it's just, a, it's just the most banal way to waste your time going to meetings. Then you will go to listen to conference, to present, or you need to get to meet others. And believe me, those residents from other programs will be the chairman of other programs in 20 years. And in 20 years, you will be 20 years older, not younger. <laughs> Each one of you, I am already 20 years older. So you will not be resident forever. And at some point, one of your colleagues from the NMRPA will be the something somewhere else and can help your future trainees your future colleagues, 
So the networking helps. It's very important. It's probably the single most important leadership skill that you have to have is good network. Why is it, why is it LinkedIn next? So, so the, the democratic style will always help to, uh, to promote that networking. But now networking should be valuable. I mean, you don't network in a pragmatic way when it doesn't speak your values. That is really relevant. You have to be very honest with it. Now, who's this guy? That Guardiola, right? He's probably one of the best, if not the best, soccer coach in the world. Um, he's, from, he's from Spain. He used to, and now he knows Manchester City, he used to be the coach for Barcelona. But he created, a, he revolutioned soccer in the 21st century. That the standards for performance were above what they were used to. And, and he was already leading with high value athletes. He do what he knows, he drives promotion initiatives, and try to get quick results from a highly motivated team. So you need to have a motivated team, and then you push them forward. Like, you guys are highly motivated team. So let's do the pay setting. So you want to push them to do more research, right? <laughs> and more publications. All of them have to have a paper by the end of the July 2020. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> no, uh, no the, thing, the, the thing is, just created the motivation to achieve more things. Now, it can have a negative impact on climate. Well, here's the deal. The impact on climate doesn't mean that's a bad thing. Not everything can be, I mean, we try, a good leader needs to be focused also on, on emotional safety, and uh, this is psychological safety is very important. You cannot be uh, a stranger to psychological safety of your team. Psychological safety is very wide because when there's psychological safety, everybody will be more productive. Everybody will be able to achieve more. But sometimes the impact on that could be negative. So you have to be cautious on how you implement the pace setting without sacrificing psychology. But when people engage, you know what? Like if you go to and you're paying $100 an hour for to getting a personal trainer, well, you're not paying $100 an hour just to go there and, and sit down with the other people this way, right? The person is able to, okay, give me another one. <laughs> and, a, and you're going to hate that person to the deepest part of your heart. <laughs> but you know what? That's good for you. <laughs> so this is kind of a, and, and then, but, but then you realize what I'm doing is good. So it is that balance of the... Um, uh, the person is motivated and also, this is hard, but it will be good. It will be painful, but it, it will get better. <clears throat> so the coaching leader, now everybody is, I mean, I, I'm getting training. I'm my coach at the clinic. We're going to get certified. Um, I do this just to help my peers, my residents, my colleagues, not to sell it as a private thing or anything like that. But now, now it happened that LinkedIn is full of coaches. <laughs> Um, so the coaches is going to help other people. It, it works well with good things. He like always developing. Like let's try to do something. Okay, you are struggling with completing your notes. Let's explore why. The coach is not going to tell you. He's going to ask you. Why do you think it's going on? Okay, what else? So you're having a hard time finish your notes because. It takes time for you to round, okay? At what time you write it round? Why that? Well, I live very far away. Or I have to put my kid in the school bus. Or I have to do this other thing, okay? Well, let's come up with creative ways so that you resolve the problem. In a, in a ni nice, positive way. It, you're not going to tell you, you're going to try solutions. So, I think coaching style is probably what you are probably using more nowadays. Or, or you're more the coercive style. <laughs> so, you know, the coaching, the coaching time will help. Now, the problem is when you have somebody who is not engaged with the vision and mission of the place, who is not really caring, who is not really, who, who can be a, a job for the organization, that may not necessarily. I mean, you try this. 
If it doesn't work, you have to move to other different elements. You always be democratic, right, to listen and deliberate listening, but then you may have to be authoritarian and then coercive. If that doesn't work, then it's when it's the time to do uh, FPP, when you put probation, when you do other things, and then you do termination. I mean, it's unfortunately good leadership not, not always work, but you try to fix the problem. You always try as hard as you can to fix the problem. So this is a, um, the top five characteristics of best leadership based on a, a, a many thousand, a hundred, a many thousand uh, answers from 195 global leaders. They have 74 qualities. The five, five top qualities, strong ethics and safety. Strong ethics is top one. Self-organizing. Having an efficient learning, being always able to learn. Uh, the nurturing of growth, and also having networking, and they send they belong to the organization. It's hard to see, and it's hard for me to see leaders that come to place. They use the place as a trampoline. I've been using single all the time. To them. They come and they go. They come for two, two, two years there. It's good for their career. They don't really fix anything. They don't really improve it, and they go to. It. So a good leader should have connection and belonging to the place. That's really important. The, 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 the guy that is keep jumping organization, that's not what you want to bring to your organization. Unless they were jumping and making that organization better, they go to the and make it better, well, that's a different bully. Often it's not the case. So the best leaders, you know, they have a couple of things. They trust to do the job. They seek the advice for each one of the people. They find a opportunity to let each member of the team to shine. It's important, that's very important. I mean, allowing them. Are always grateful and recognize the contribution. They have the back in tough time. I mean, this is really important. There will be a situation, I mean, you have a situation where maybe a, a clinic, let's say a um, liability issue. There's clinical risk. There's a lawsuit, there's a discussion. Well, there could be two, 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 two ways to do that. One is, chop your head off, get out of here. The other is, okay, we'll help you, we'll go with you, we'll let's explore, we'll support you. This tough time, we'll come in with you. That's hard to do, and that requires changing culture. They say stories. Stories are very powerful. So whenever you want to start engaging your patient, engaging your team, have a story. If you realize, I mean, you have Peter Pronovos here, right? By the way, have you ever met Peter Pronovos in person? You have, you know. No, okay, well, don't waste your time. Make an appointment with him. I, one of my residents is Croatian, Dr. Kurinsic. And you know what I did? I made an appointment with him and Dr. Mihaljevic. You know who Dr. Mihaljevic is? Tomislav Mihaljevic, he's the CEO of the Cleveland Clinic. I sit in the Board of Governors, I meet him every two weeks. I said, hey, Tom, can my resident meet you? Absolutely. I mean, it's the same city, same place. My resident was super intimidated. He canceled the meeting. I made a second meeting. He, they met. He gave him a full hour of his time. He came shining. I mean, able to meet, network, and, and, and get the third. The reason why they came with Pronovo, because Pronovo, I mean, you know what he has done with patient safety, right? He revamped John Hopkins and used all this. He always started with a dramatic story of a girl that died. And we're pediatrician, we don't like kids to die, but you know, kids are human, they die. So, but, but this kid died from human error, from mistakes that doctors made. But they started with a story that grabbed your heart, and then they delivered. So get to know Pronovo, you have a homework, all of you. I don't care if he's busy. He's here for you to go and meet him. He's an anesthesiologist, a nice guy. Make an appointment in his office. Dr. Stehauer asked us to make an appointment with you. Explain <laughs> 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 on him. No. <laughs> and you see him in the hallway, stop him and introduce him. Hi, Dr. Pronovo. Hey, hey, I am John. I'm Moises. It's nice to meet you. I'm one of the Methodist residents here. 
Uh, by the way, my, my German uh, doctor, he, he, he has a poster of you in his office. So no, you get to know him. That, that, he's a master storyteller. Always tell things to engage people. So the good leader challenges you. Okay, you're said cool. How about, okay, you got a 70% in training. Well, that's terrific. How about next year you get the 80th percentile, the 90th percentile? Or how, the, you know what, you have this excellent case. Why don't we present it in the AAP or the MedSpeak meeting? Or you have this fantastic shirt. Why don't, why don't we write it? So you keep moving. Gratitude, gratitude is fundamental. You be grateful with your nurses. Always tell them, hey, thank you for taking excellent care of my patient today. That, that, that goes a long way. Responsiveness, answering the page, answering email, answering the phone. Able to recognize when they're wrong and apologizing. Give credit. And always, the most important thing, be caring and treat people with dignity and respect. Being empathetic. But this is fundamental. Every single person. So, creating a culture of leadership requires defining the organizational culture, building accountability, that's fundamental, and having exposure to decision making by coaching and mentoring. So, case has a lot of resources for, for leadership. Try to tap on these, and we have to see what we have for trainees. But there are resources for coaching and mentoring. So I like this, this um, sentence, so I, I put it, that effective leaders, so they say effective, so effectiveness is very important. You can be a leader, but be very ineffective. So effective leaders, they have a person to have a genuine interest in the long-term development of their employees. They use that and social skills to encourage them to achieve their best. You can provide feedback. So you may not be achieving your best, you have opportunities. We all have. We can all improve. And I'm telling you, I get these balanced scorecards with performance. I can always do better. That's why I don't like them, but that's fine. But the, my, my chairman tell me how to improve them. It's not about being nice. A good leader is not being nice. But they can tap on the motivation to further an organization goal. So this, you know, I, this is Dr. Greenleaf. Robert Green, is he created the term servant leadership. So this means when you serve, you're a leader not for your own ego, but you do, you're a leader to help others, to help your organization. So by helping others and helping the organization, you thrive, you grow, you get better. So you may not have all the answers, but you are listening and you are able to uh, engage other people into taking the decision in a collective way. So I'm just going to go really fast. We have only 12 minutes left. I may want to have five minutes for answers and questions. But effective leadership will be also understanding uh, how a team is made. And there's a uh, uh, different part of the formation of teams. When you form, storming, norming, and performing. So this will be happening and you'll be seeing. So this is by Lencioni. And Lencioni describes all these five characteristics when it comes to this functional team. So one, the team, P stands for trust. There's no trust. When you don't trust each other, there's no good teamwork. Execution. There's fear of conflict and therefore nothing happens. Accountability. You don't take each other accountable. If you are in a team and, okay, you are writing a paper together, and you are in charge of the, I don't know, a literature, let's say a team on diaper rashes, the paper on diaper rashes. They are going to focus on autoimmune diseases, you are going to focus on infectious diseases, you are going to focus on nutritional diseases. And you meet, and one of you has not written the part. Well, you have to hold each other accountable. If you don't do that, then that person will not deliver. At some point, that will lead to a dysfunctional theme, and the paper will not be written by the time. Does that make sense? I use that. And management, when you don't look at results, you don't look at the balance worker, you don't look at the things that have to be done. And emotional intelligence will be five characteristics that we all need to have, because you all have a lot of intellectual intelligence, but we all have to develop emotional intelligence. 
which is not something we all necessarily. I, I, I have had to develop it. I mean, it was a, a situation of taking courses for that. And when you look at that self-awareness, being aware of, of what, you know what, I'm getting angry, I'm feeling my, my face is getting red. So be aware, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to start reacting so you control yourself. The self-awareness. How you are. So that, the, that allows you to recognize um, things. So self-awareness is that you, you become very aware of yourself and you have more confidence. Self-regulation. Very able to, to control the emotions and provide a more modulated way of doing things. And then you can be open to change, you can have comfort with ambiguity, and you have integrity. Motivation. When you are really e eager to identify things that make you move forward, and you have a strong drive to achieve, you maintain optimism in the state of failure. We can still do those things. Empathy. You communicate well with different cultures. You are able to reflect on your own culture, cultural differences, and you have cultural humility. Cultural humility is paramount to have as part of leadership. And the social skills, the ability to build a network. As I told you, that's the single most important leadership skill, network. You are, you are going to go on a network with, with Bronovos, and you may end up getting a paper once again. It's not about the paper, it's about the connection and achievement. So leaders are made, they're not born, you can all develop this. This part of the lecture is part of this. Uh, leaders must be adapted to different circumstances. Focus on the team and the organization. And emotional intelligence is definitely a, a characteristic that has to be developed. You know who this gentleman is? General Colin Powell. So General Colin Powell said, the day your soldiers stop bringing you their problems is the day you have stopped leading them. So bring your problem to Dr. T. Howard, please, <laughs> every day. So, so, um, so, so, so it's very, this is very important to reflect. A leader cannot be overwhelmed cannot be unreachable, cannot be, well, I have too much on my plate. No, no, if you step on the leadership plate, then you have to have accountability. And this is, to me, very powerful. The moment oh, everything is fine, everything is cool, nothing going on, no, well, then they tell you, when you, there's always some, it's always a burning platform, there's always some fire you have to put down. I mean, not that you want to be full of problems, not, not the, 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 what it means. What it means that people trust you and that you're having an influence. So thank you guys, I appreciate your attention, and I'm open for questions. Yeah. I was wondering, how do you assess the situation as a leader and figuring out which leadership style will best help your your No, no, no that, that, is, that is a great question. Um, for example, um, when we're leading now with um, ACP, Ohio chapter, right? How can I engage a membership to remain as members or and to be... Well, we have to understand, are they, they really understand what being in ACP means? Do they really understand what the vision and mission means? Do they really have an engagement in that? How can I, are we bringing them value? Are we even look tapping? So that will help me to, okay, women may probably need to have like, I know the coaching to engage them, discuss with them, the democratic. I mean, there's no need to do coercive or, or, or maybe authoritative in setting a vision, but with, you, with, you, with the community, it will be more about tapping into their own values and having, you know, that you are selling them something, but you are really allowing them to acknowledge and recognize the value of belonging to the organization. The same thing with AAP, for example. So now, if I am in a situation where we're in the floor, we have an issue right now. An issue is documentation. Well, it happens that my 
pediatric resident, they think that the family history is irrelevant. So they don't have family history. HMP say family history not on file. That happened to you guys? <laughs> well, well, the main problem is if you, I mean, and I have some residents that they come from the best medical school in India, they aim all in the Institute of Medical Science, and I tell them, okay, you have this HMP that has no history on file. I am going to copy this HMP and I'm going to fax it to the guy from AIM that wrote your letter of recommendation. Do you think he will be proud of you? You see the face. I'm not going to do that. But the point is, and I mean, why do you do a mediocre job when you, because that's not how an HMP should be done. I mean, that, that's a problem, how I have to have like a, a more authoritative style. This is not okay. I have to keep the person accountable. I have to change the way my, my face looks. It's not like, oh. what do you think that you just put the family history on fire? I mean, I, no, I mean, what type of doctor we're raising now? That's a problem, because we all will be 20 years older in 20 years. And we're perpetuating bad practices that's going to affect the way we're going to be taken care of. So that's why I have to think, like the same thing with any quality issue in the hospital, you bring the burning platform, you try to engage, but depending what it is, if one thing like we're having issues of people having um, adverse effects with medication and nursing units, well, you have to investigate, you have to create a, a discussion, but you have to be more coercive probably. Maybe stop the pharmacy here, stop the, the line, what's going on? And engage people, you create a burning platform. It's, it's not necessarily the most important case. When we were in the pandemic at the very beginning, it was a little bit of coercive and authoritarian style. Uh, why? Because we needed to, to secure access for patients, and we needed everybody to tap in. And we need to, the pediatrician to be, to be part of the medicine um, schedule, because we were going to explode. And we actually even created a new hotel where the medical school is. If you have not gone, if you, if you go to the school building, we put a 500, 300 beds with oxygen lines getting ready to have a field hospital. So that required a coercive and authoritative leadership style based on the circumstance. And then for you as a chief resident, it will be based on things. I mean, you want to develop the best doctors but then you need to find out. I mean, I use documentation as something that I personally, it triggers me a lot of anger and makes me very, very upset. And you, you see the change in my voice. Uh, and it is because it's not acceptable and we are normalizing a really bad behavior. The copy pasting, I mean, that's terrible. <laughs> We're not doing H. We cannot take HMPs anymore. I mean, uh, in Mexico, an HMP was like, the most important thing. You have to, we, we do family history with pedigrees. We don't do pedigrees. I mean, it, it, it becomes more a document for a building rather than something to help patients. And, and, and we have changed. So that, for me, helps me to provide in, an immediate one-on-one -on -one coaching, democratic, but sometimes some course to uh, go and ask the patient the family history and type it on right now. I mean, but I give a sense of purpose why that's important. Some people tell me, well, it doesn't really matter. A patient came with an asthma exacerbation. Sure, I, I understand that, that perspective, but an HMP is an HMP in any part of the world. And when you start for uh, making sure you, do, you don't do the full job, eventually it, it, it becomes a pervasive problem that transcends beyond just the HMP. And the mediocrity starts taking over a lot of other things. So just, that, that's what I, my, my burning platform is, that becomes a marker of how you start doing things in other domains. That makes sense? So, so that, that's what I, I, I would do the, the, this is a one on one. Most of the time, the coaching is kind of where, I, where, where, you, where you lead, because we have very highly motivated people, and a pace coaching and pace setting. A low patient is defined as um, negative in the environment. It may not necessarily be, but it could be like if my chairman say, well, we, are, uh, we have SHM uh, abstract submission deadline November 11, 
I would like all of you to submit at least one clinical meeting. Well, the problem is not everybody can go to the meeting, right? But we're going to have some virtual presentation that try at least. Some people will be very motivated to do that. Some people will not. The problem will be whether if you don't do that, you have a negative consequence. That should not be negative consequence. But it, it, it's also a situation of you belong to very prestigious organization. Well, what are the expectations for a physician? Because then otherwise you can work in private practice. What are the expectations for a doctor that works in UH versus a doctor that works in a private practice? Which is a little different, right? I mean, you, they should all have a faculty appointment in K. They should be moving toward an associate professor or eventually professor. But that requires that the staff. So how can you promote that motivation? You tap into that. But you don't want to lose your human resources because, oh, you know what? It's too much. I'd rather go. I mean, no. You want to keep the people. You want to inspire. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Uh...